All right. It's just another Kill Team podcast here to talk about Necromunda Hive Secundus. Not something that me and Jason were expecting to get, but thank you, GW. Yes, thanks, GW, for the uh, preview copy of the new Necromunda stuff. And because we have literally no idea what's happening with Necromunda, we decided to bring in Goonhammer's Fowler, Necromunda extraordinaire, and I've watched him run the last two Goonhammer Opens with his incredible Necromunda terrain. So he's here to help us figure out what's really going on, because neither me nor Jason can truly review this copy in any way that makes something that approaches sense. Thank you very much. I feel very much the same about Kill Team. So you're going to be the first ones that I bug when I need to play Kill Team. Thank you for having me. Yeah, it's a yeah. So, so on that note, um, what what's your like ten thousand foot overview of Hive Secundus? Like, how does this compare to the other boxes for Necromunda? So I think if you really zoom out. All of the boxes would let you jump into some slice of Necromunda with two people nicely. Uh, like the very first one was Escher and Goliath, and it had like the Zone Mortalis in there. All of that stuff, you could play a perfectly fine Necromunda forever with that. And then Dark Uprising was the Corpse Grinders and the, um, the Enforcers. And that box as well, it was weirder, but you could certainly still play perfectly fine Necro with that forever if you wanted to. And Hive War was a more distinct starter with that. Uh, but the issue, again, was that like you don't have enough terrain with that. In that case, you have like a 3D terrain. There's not really a lot to play. A perfectly nice game in Necromunda, you'd want to get more. But zooming back into Secundus now, Secundus has maps that have pre-laid out Zone Mortalis on them. So there's already like where your battlefield is, where the walls are, and where the traps are. And you have two... A, like asymmetrical gangs, you know, they're not necessarily the same, so you might need a different setup for who's playing, but it follows in the tradition of, like, this is what you need for two people, and probably one sicko who's really into Necromunda bringing someone new into the fold, it's perfectly great to start out there, or if either of the gangs interest you. So it's definitely, it could be a, a foray for you get to get into Necromunda. So both teams in the box are fully legal kill or Necromunda teams, gangs, I, I think as they are called, going into full Necromunda play. Because looking at the box as a kill team player, I don't really know if either side is like a full Necromunda experience because it does seem like those Oris mech suits definitely seem pretty powerful. But I haven't actually looked at the rules and having no context, I don't actually know if they're actually as good as they look. Uh, they're They're pretty good. <laughs> so the going into this with the gangs out of there, um, the book doesn't have the full rules to bring them into the foray for a overall campaign, but there is a book following up, and uh, GW just previewed that, and it looks like that would be what you'd need to bring them out into a full campaign. It's more that usually in these boxes, if there's gear or abilities that don't really fit into that, uh, like Ash Wastes and some of the previous ones were like that. There's a follow-up book later that will have the full gang lists for that. And that would mean you could either run Spires, which this box doesn't have all of them, so you'd certainly need more, uh, or other gangs led by a Spirer to delve in. And then on the flip side, Malstrain really doesn't have enough here to come into a gang. They use a different system other than what other, one, other gangs do. Other gangs use credits, and the Malstrain use Malstrain points to figure out how many guys you put on the board. And that's not a mechanic that's really broken down in a larger campaign. But I think the right intrepid um, arbitrator that would really want to bring those in between now and when that other book comes out could figure something. All right. And this is a pretty good, is this like a good microcosm of Necromunda? Because I've looked at Necromunda from afar every time there's a new article, just because you know we follow along with the Warcom articles just because they're easy things for us to look at. And Necromunda has had a lot of different settings over the last six years since I've been interacting with Warhammer again, between Ash Waste and the Succession Wars and whatever else has been happening before that during Kill Team 18's time. There's a lot of different like mini settings. How do these all tie in together for Secundus? Does Secundus feel like its own thing or does it connect well with the broader Necromunda verse? Yeah, Secundus really is, is a... Uh a deeper version of what's happened before and essentially a uh, a niche version of the original 
uh, Underhive box. So when 17 came out with Underhive, there were Zone Mortalis tiles, uh, cardboard tiles, and you could lay them out. Secundus has the mats, and Secundus is a Zone Mortalis campaign, but you are in a deeper part of a ruined hive that's been taken over by uh, the Malstrain, which are basically gene stealers that are so messed up that they got cut off from, uh, from the rest of the hive. They don't care about them anymore. <laughs> They're like, we don't know you anymore. You're not invited to the party. Uh, and in that ruined hive, I think Zone Mortalis is a great way for people to get into Necromunda because you really don't need a lot of 3D terrain. Uh, you don't need a lot of space for it, and you could just throw down some mats and a couple of doors, and you have a nice battlefield when you have those mats. And there are a lot less mechanics, for sure. Ash Waste is really cool. I've run many campaigns, but Ash Waste is really complicated. And 3D Sector Mechanicus uh, is really hard to get right in terms of how much time and money it takes to make a really nice battlefield for it. And again, that does lead to, for new people, you might have some gotchas with full line of sight if you haven't dealt with that before. And as much fun as it is to fall off of something on fire, uh, I think if your first bite of Necromunda is Zone Mortalis, there's a lot less mental load for it. But the odd part of it is that this is not a, this doesn't feel as Necromunda in terms of the gangs that are in there, but I don't necessarily think that's a huge problem. Because in the book they say, generally you'd want to have the arbitrator be playing as the Malstrain. And I think that is a great way to think of you're the, the DM, the game master, for somebody who maybe is newer to Necromunda or wants a specific type of experience. And they, it's kind of aliens. You know, you're walking around in the dark, your guys can't generally see very far, and your, uh, your monsters can see in the dark, you can sneak up on people, and they're all pretty nasty in melee. So I think there's an interesting, it's Necromunda bootstrapped into something a little bit different with a really cool atmosphere. And I think it might not be everyone's cup of tea, but I do think this is a cool way to get into Necromunda with maybe a more experienced person bringing new people in. I think, so Kill Team has a mini mode that they release in the White Dwarf called Prisoner, where one experienced player plays against two other players in a three-way game, where the Prisoner gets like one very powerful psychic psyker and a bunch of dorks while two other players play their full kill teams and kind of like learn the game together. I feel like I've heard Secundus having a mode like this where the Oris, the two big mech suits work differently than the rest of the Vansar gangers and they can fight against the Arbitrator, I think you were saying, together. Is that a mode that is supported and even recommended or am I gaslighting myself? Yeah, that's the that's the campaign. So the campaign is the uh, the incursion gang, which is led by the Spire, and then he has a bunch of Vansar friends. And the neat thing about the loadout that you have there is that there aren't really wild weapons in there. You have uh, a bunch of las guns, a las pistol. Um, one guy can have a combi flamer melee weapon and one rad gun. And for Vansar, that's a lot less power than usual. So the way it works out is your Spirer, who can have, like, bolt guns for hands <laughs> with power fists, uh, he's the important one, be partially because he's your leader, and if he dies, you lose the campaign. <laughs> so it really works out that the Vansar are the mooks, and the star is that Spirer. And the, the way in modern Necro you deal with the Spirer needing to be scary and powerful besides the stat line is... He gets, to, he gets two goes each turn. So normally, similar to Kill Team, generally, uh, action economy is pretty similar. You get two things you can do. And in Necromunda, the, you know, your average ganger otherwise will have two things they can do. Run, shoot, uh, etc. The Spire can do the two actions twice. So that is another part of why he's beefy, and it gives him a little bit more scariness on the board even though uh you know the Malstrain may be able to tear through his armor pretty powerfully there <laughs> uh, i think it's a nice balance overall and i think that it will get people thinking about how they want to protect the vip but also utilize the sort of unique powerful guns he has that are all pretty short range yeah, the big chonky boy is very cool to build kind of a little fiddly in my experience building them and it 
is cool to hear about the old lore when I'm looking up old Necromunda stuff about how the Spire Gangers suits unlock. Do they go over that a lot in the book? Is that like something that players should be looking forward to for Secundus? Yeah, that's all mechanical. And so the, the lore of it is that when you are in one of the, the fancy houses in Necromunda, uh, you don't just get to be the Nepo baby. You have to earn it by playing the most dangerous game. So they send you out into the hive with this tricked out suit. Uh, there's four different types. And the suit inherently is it's powerful, but it gains more power as you kill people. And as, it, as you go, it may make you faster, or it may make you more resilient, or potentially unlock the ability to do other combat actions. So in the game, mechanically, the way that the, uh, in this specific campaign, that Spire powers up, it is based on if you get knocked out, you might gain glitches, which are bad. <laughs> or if you kill people, you can level up potentially, and you could choose what those levels up, level ups are. So it's a really neat mechanic that definitely plays into the flavor of that. Um, and I think it's a nice way that you can feel them progress, and that makes that risk-reward of whether you want to push it with your, with your important guy. Uh, I think that makes it pay off very nicely. You haven't gotten a chance to play any of the Kill Team narrative stuff, so do you want to preview kind of some of the upgrades and maybe me and Jason can talk about things in Kill Team narrative that maybe we've had some experience with? Cause, mostly because I haven't read the books. So I really don't have a ton of context on it. So I'm kind of curious what some of these upgrades feel like because the Oris Gangers that come in the box, those are the hulking brutes because the other ones that they've previewed all are much more lithe looking suits. How does how do they present the power of the Aura suits? One of the coolest benefits that the Spire can get there is thickened armor. So it increases his armor save, uh, and he can get up to a two-up save, which is pretty amazing. Uh, they're already they already have pretty good saves as it is, and the um, the survivability they have there uh, at a two-up is pretty ridiculous. So I think that definitely makes them a lot scarier. And uh, the most, I think the most common one people are going to take is giving them a weapon skill or ballistic skill upgrade. And for them, uh, that's pretty big because essentially being able to push yourself with two upgrades to a max of hitting on a two is absolutely horrifying. Especially when some of the guns that they have access to, it's essentially, you know, mini bolters on their hands that they could use in close combat or guns that if someone were to take uh, enough damage for there to be an injury roll, you just go out of action. It's not like you even roll to see, is it a flesh wound? Am I seriously injured? Am I dead? It's just, you're just dead. Uh, so I think that the way that's all going to work out is it's just going to be a, you're going to have horrifying beast machines who are, you know, running amongst all of your las gun guys who are trying not to get eaten. While the gigantic spiky Tyranids come in from all corners as the humans kind of take pot shots at the back end, right? Exactly. I just I just built uh, the Malstrain, and they are bigger and weirder than I thought they were going to be. They're fantastic models. They are a very spiky sprue. I only built the Oris Gangers as of this recording, and I am kind of looking forward to building the Malstrain. I don't know if I'm ever going to get a chance to play them, but maybe we'll run a Necromunda intro thing for Secundus when this box drops, and we can try to get some games in. The You mentioned that... Secundus is a much flatter thing, and Zone Mortalis gets brought up a couple times here. Is Zone Mortalis purely a flat experience as far as terrain goes, or is there a little bit of 3D element to it normally? Because I think the box only comes with one small terrain sprue and one mat that gets turned over on two sides, if I remember correctly. Yeah, so the the gen I guess the, t the category of Zone Mortalis overall is the you're in the sort of bulkheads gangways section of of the hives and the as the box goes the terrain you get is doors and doors can be very impactful uh you know closing access closing a door on somebody uh there's a lot of fun play there but the out of the box you're going to be playing fully 2d but zone mortalis as depicted in the 3d terrain that they sell um like there's the ruined zone mortalis sections that they're selling at the same time as this and all the historical ones that they've released. There is a, a 3D notion in that zone mortalis where generally you'd think of it as being just like a couple levels. 
Uh, it does require a pretty hefty amount of terrain to, to pull that off, but I do like playing on that type of board. I think that at the uh, sort of a little bit of 3D element makes it a little bit more interesting than just walking around hallways. Which is what Secundus yeah. will be. Correct, yeah. Yeah, so then like Secundus is is the flat cardboard starter version, and then if you're looking for more, like the Zone Mortalis kits that are floating around and the new Ruined Zone Mortalis are like, you can build them up, you can make them 3D, you can stack them, you can build towers. Um, I only have a little bit of experience with the with the 3D Zone Mortalis, but it is very, very cool looking. Yeah, and it's all really modular as well. You know, you can leave a few pieces apart easily. Uh, they come together really nicely. They break down um, and, and store really nicely. So I think it's a cool, if you want to invest in it, it's certainly not inexpensive and it is a decent amount of work to paint it all, but the end results and what you can get out of it is pretty fantastic. All right, all right. So as far as expanding or reusing the content of Secundus, do you feel like Secundus is good for basically people who want to play other gangs in the setting or is it very much you need to play the Malstrain against whoever comes into the hive like how how forced is the gang pairing from the box for the contents in the box you'd really want to be playing the incursion gang as it's in there versus the Malstrain uh, there's a mechanic where the the Vansar have these four abilities where they could like do a medical action or, or try to make weapons in the post game. And an arbitrator could certainly figure out how to bootstrap that onto any other gang. But um, I think in general, this experience is pretty self-contained. Uh, so I think it'd be difficult to bring in other gangs into this specific experience. All right. Uh, and as a kill team players, you know, we generally don't end up like if someone plays Secundus, they're really into it and they want to start getting into Necromunda. There's a lot of other hobbying aspects that Necromunda provides that general kill team plastic kits haven't really done. Jason is painting up the two Forge World models, the I think the Proxy and the Fixer. Yep, Proxy and Fixer, and they are both resin. How's that experience? I haven't dealt been, with Jason? resin models in a while. You know, it was super easy to to work with, honestly. Um, it was definitely some of the, the nicer resin models I've dealt with in a while. Um, it was, you know, you just like, you you clip them off the, the sprue, but it's a little different. Clean them up a little bit, sort out which pieces go where, and pop them together. Yeah, I think resin is a thing that a lot of Kill Team players basically get to avoid, right? Because Kill Team is a mainline GW game at this point. Fowler, you've obviously had a lot more experience with resin also because you play a lot of Necromunda. Are is all Forge World resin equivalent? Like, are you ex should players what should players know as kill team players or just kill team or necro curious people about how large the resin range is and how what are the fiddly things that they have to deal with when thinking about getting into Necromunda? Yeah, there are a lot of fantastic Necromunda kits that are resin, and I think the more modern it is the easier experience it's going to be in general uh, in, in many ways. And I think the interesting caveat to that is that the older a model is, then you might start to get some other problems as well. <laughs> so um, I think the balance there would be like you buy a kit when it comes out and you might get, you know, the best experience there. And really the negatives there would just be as over time, you might see more air bubbles uh, as well. But Resin is, is a little strange to deal with if you're used to working with styrene plastic, especially if you're a plastic glue person and you're used to welding <laughs> and that being very user-friendly. Uh, so the number one thing I would say, if you're working with resin, uh, I would make sure that you wash it. So you could just use a little bit of hand soap and wash it in warm water with a toothbrush. Uh, I have a little strainer that I have just for doing model work and just rinse it nicely after. Um, if you you know wash it with a toothbrush and let it dry out, uh, you'll be rewarded. Sometimes there isn't mold release on these, but sometimes there might sneakily be a bit. And the issue would be if you don't wash that off when you prime it, that paint might just come right off. So I'd highly recommend washing the resin you work with. Um, I tend to take a couple pictures as well uh, before I go too far, <laughs> just to make sure I haven't lost anything, even with the instructions. Um, 
I think that's helpful just in case you um, you have any issues there. And big help, the if you've never worked with resin before, the new thing you're going to run into, it's not a mold line, it's called a mold slip. And that is that with the type of mold that you have for resin, they might be like just a part of a millimeter apart, just the tiniest bit. And with those, it might be helpful to you know put a mask on and use a little bit of fine grit sandpaper to work on it. But if you catch one of these after the fact, uh, I'll make sure the guys link this. There's a Vince Venturella video where he uses matte varnish, a little bit of straight out of the pot matte varnish. And you just put a few layers of that on there and that mold slip or mold line is gonna disappear. So I'd recommend that if you're doing resin, please <laughs> keep your pot of uh, matte varnish there for the inevitable mold slips you find after. And resin is poisonous, right? So you mentioned putting on a respirator before you go sanding. That's definitely one thing that I think a lot of plastic players probably would not be used to. So make sure to be careful when you're working with resin. Yeah, it's less, no particulate is good for you, but resin is way less good for you. So please wear a mask when you're working with any fine particulates, but especially resin uh, if you're not used to doing it. Yeah, so Secundus, Excellent buy. I think it's like $170 coming in in a couple weeks. Where is your opinion as both a big Necro player and maybe someone trying to get new people in? Is it a 10 out of 10 both ways or, you know, where's the number at? I think it's my, my heart is in that this is a cool experience that I really want to run with one of my friends who's who loves Necromunda, but he's not as uh, sort of immediately out there playing. And I, he plays Vansar, and I'm excited to bring him in with it. So I think immediately, like, the retail of the plastic in there we worked out is probably right around 170 So I, if you like what's in there, especially if you play Vansar, there's cool new poses, a lot of hands with nothing in them, which is a important thing in Necromunda for kit bashing. <laughs> um, that's a really cool box overall for the plastic if you're excited about it. Uh, if you want to play the self-contained experience, if the idea of there being sort of an Aliens style um, arbitrated experience is something that you want to run with somebody, or you want to find an experienced player who would run that with you, I think that's fantastic. I do think the difficult part is the sell for people who are net new, because the models in here are not easy to put together. <laughs> They're very spiky, fiddly. Um, you mentioned the Spirers. Like these are really complicated kits in terms of how many pieces and especially small pieces are in there. So I would say if you are an experienced modeler and you want to get into Necromunda and the sort of bug hunt that's, let's say not quite Space Hulk, you are way less well-armed, <laughs> um, more aliens. If that interests you and you want a modeling challenge and someone wants to step up and play the bad guys and make a cool experience, uh, this is a really cool play. So I think where we're at with the Goonhammer review is we really like it as a self-contained box, but I think where people are, might stumble a little is, like, if you're net new to Necro, this is a little difficult to step up there in terms of, like, the models are difficult to work with. There's a lot of, not kit bashing, but there's a lot of customization in here, more so than you would get with a, a more noob-friendly product. So for anyone who is one of our normal Kill Team listeners or watchers and is curious about Necro after hearing that, is there another box that GW sells that would be a better starting point outside of Secundus? Yeah, if you can ever find the original 2017 Underhive box, buy it. <laughs> um, and that might sound like a weird recommendation because the, be the book in there is outdated, but it comes with old cardboard tiles and it has Goliath and Escher. Uh, really classic matchup. That box is pretty amazing. If you ever see it, buy it. <laughs> uh, the other one would be if you see the Hive War box. That is also a great pick. Uh, that one isn't as great out of the box in terms of the play surface. You know, there is some 3D terrain in there, and it's a little light for what you normally want to play, but you can still play great names and uh, games of Necromunda with it. So those two are good there, and I think if those are also a little difficult in terms of modeling, but I think if you've done Kill Team kits before, it should be fine. Especially if you've done like Eldar, you're good with Escher. Eldar, famously one of the worst sprues, I think, for the <laughs> Corsair Void Scars. I think you have to play like Where's Waldo over four sprues, which is a miserable experience. 
yeah, I saw how complicated they were, and I we had the preview of that, and I did put out the call to see if one of our other painters wanted to <laughs> want to work on them. <laughs> All right, so Secundus, goodbye for anyone who's super interested in Necro. From the kill team side, looking at it, this kind of echoes the prisoner mission from White Dwarf I don't know, somewhere somewhere in the middle of the first year, where you get to play one NPC gang against two real people, and you basically get to onboard them very slowly. But it is a unique experience, not the full game of Necromunda. So I think the box, from what I saw, they're playing over five five games. And then you basically have one necromond experience but if you want to play the full game with you know normal gangs or just like a normal progression system that necromunda incentivizes you're probably best off getting one of the other box kits is what it sounds like yeah exactly and the the core rule book that came out last year uh it's a really fantastic one-stop shop for most of that it doesn't have the gang rules in there so you would need to go looking for those separately but that book really it captures everything you need like all the core stuff all of the vehicle or otherwise rules for that, for the play spaces, all the core stuff. So that in and of itself is a great place to start. Alrighty. Well, that seems like a good end point for us. You know, we've covered a little bit about what the box contents are, what you can expect to get out of Necromunda High Secundus from a bunch of people who have no idea what's going on with it. Thanks Fowler for coming on and catching up with us. Well, thank you very much for having me. And thank you, friends, for watching until the end. <laughs>